Good morning. Uh, grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's great to see uh, all of you out this morning. Uh, a little surprised at the numbers. I was expecting less than 20. Uh, welcome to worship at First Church in Monongahela. Uh, when the pastors are away and Susan's away and the choir is not singing and uh, they hear that Brian Charlton is going to be standing here, uh, they seem to stay away in droves. But you, you, you've surprised me this morning. Uh, we have uh, Debbie Hurlbert at the uh, console this morning. She plays every bit as well as Sue. It's an inside joke for those of you who don't know what I'm saying. Uh, so th I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, do we have, uh, and of course we have Diana Mason here is, is going to be the one that's watching over me to make sure that I don't make any mistakes. I know, I know she's turning red and shaking her head. Uh, so... Um, do we have any announcements that we need to make from the um, from the congregation? Anything coming up this week, Jeff? Thank you. The Deacons uh, Food Basket Ministry, one of the one of the stalwart. Uh, missions of, of, of this church that we're very, very pleased to, to have. Anyone else? Diana. Okay, congregational meeting. Uh, is that going to be in any a, a letter or something to the congregation? Or? Okay, so this is our official announcement of it. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you that question later. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, um, well, let's prepare our minds and hearts to worship Almighty God. Would you join with me in the call to worship? Though there are rulers, presidents, kings, queens, God is the Lord of all life. God requires our faithfulness and our service. Come, let us worship the Lord who is always with us. Let's stand and sing with joy.
have come this morning with full hearts, hearts that carry sorrow and worry and guilt. In this time, we offer our hearts to God, remembering Christ's invitation that all who are weary and carry heavy burdens may come to him. Trusting in that love, let us make our confession. Would you join with me? Patient Lord, you know how easy it is for us to whine and complain bitterly about all those things in our lives that are difficult. We focus on them as though they were the only things that ever happened to us, forgetting the many blessings that you have given to us and the opportunities you give us to serve you. We feel alienated. You call us beloved. We feel lost. You seek us. We feel broken and battered. Your love is a healing balm. Forgive us when we forget those things. Help us to always look to you for our healing and to return thanks to you by praise and serving others in your name. For we offer this prayer of confession of our failures and gratitude for your blessings. Rejoice in this assurance of pardon. God challenges us. God encourages us. God confronts us. And God accepts us. God works wonders in our midst and gives us the eyes, the hearts, the souls to seek, to see such miracles. Now, Sherwin is not here today, and she assured me that uh, I did not have to do uh, a children's message. Uh, I teach high school for a reason, and uh, I'm not, uh, this is not a warm and cuddly face. This is, uh, this, this is a face that uh, young kids kind of run from, so uh, we're not going to have a children's message today. The Alvarez boys are, uh, I, yeah, <laughs> look, he just came he gave me one of these. <laughs> so, uh, in moving on, let us stand and share uh, the uh, peace of Jesus Christ with one another. Sorry, Kevin. I, I, I jumped to him. I got ahead of myself. I, see, I, I circled all the things I need to do. You, you know what? You need to be up here to see how many things there are actually to do up here. So I, uh, sorry, Kevin. I apologize. But we'll have, we'll have Barb sing for us. He's right, it is different to be up. <laughs> it's even different to be down there, but it's like, I want to welcome you and, and ask for your prayers. <laughs> I do this. I love to sing, but it's different to stand in front of somebody instead of standing in your kitchen singing to yourself or whatever. <laughs> oh, sovereign God, oh, matchless King, the saints adore. 
the angels sing and fall before the throne of grace. To you belongs the highest praise. These sufferings, this passing tide, under your wings I will abide, and every enemy shall flee. You are my hope and victory. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit three in one. Clothed in power and in grace, the name above all other names. To the valley for my soul, Thy great descent has made me whole. Thy word, my heart, has welcomed home. Now peace like water ever flows. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit three. name above all other names. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit three in one, clothed in power and in grace. The name above all Thank you, Barb. I do not see the ushers gathering for, uh, so I'm going to try to stretch out some time. The, there are, th so a rabbi, a priest, oh no, let's not go there. Um, Oh, would you pray with me? Lord, we give you back only a portion, a small portion of what you have given uh, to us. Take these gifts and use them. Use them for your purposes. Use them to help people. Use them to, to make us closer to you. Uh, in all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Uh, oh, please be seated. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, my fault. Um, joys and concerns. Does anyone have any uh, 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 joys to share with us that uh, aren't on the prayer pads today? Okay, uh, praise reports uh, for good test results. Uh, for everyone present here this morning, uh, for grandchildren, Danielle Cole's 50th birthday? 50? Uh, for the beautiful day, and thanks for Brian. And my mother wrote that. Uh, for those uh, fighting colds and, or excuse me, uh, for the foundation for uh, fighting blindness walk in Pittsburgh today. That's where that's where Susan and I believe Ron are today. Uh, or no, not the fighting blindness. Theirs is the hearing one, right? There, there's all kinds of walks and things today. Yeah. But the, any other praise reports? Uh, prayer concerns. Anybody have any extra prayer concerns? Uh, for those people, uh, prayer concerns for those people fighting colds and flu and. Uh, a grieving for the fam for those uh, grieving family for those who were um, burned in, in a fire last night. There was a fire last night. Uh, I guess I, I hadn't heard about that, so we'll, we'll pray for those folks as well. Uh, hearing anything else, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Merciful, loving God, we, we thank you for the, for, for the comfort of prayer. Help us to realize the true gift of this seemingly simple act. At any moment throughout any day, we can seek your mercy, grace, and strength. Oh God, you know our every need before we even speak it. We pray first for those who are hurting today. Uh, and we can hurt in so many ways. Loneliness, isolation, fear uncertainty, grief, depression, anxiety. Comfort those people who suffer from these problems. There are people hurting physically. Be with the family that was burned in the fire. Ease the pain and the challenges uh, that they will face daily and that we all face daily. Show them mercy and a portion of your grace. Make us people of faith, O oh God. Help us to be people of the promise of Christ, always looking and reaching forward. Help us to say, serve and minister to those who live in the past, always reaching for nostalgia in the good old days. Drive us to the upward call that Paul writes about, that we are always looking forward to you. Holy God, we can't think of any solution, it seems, other than war. Make us smarter. When we begin to see others as expendable, remind us that they are also made in your divine image. When we say we can't take care of everyone who needs help, make us more generous. When we are satisfied with the divisions between races and genders and economic classes in our country, make us dissatisfied until all are treated equally. When we see weapons as our only choice, enlarge our imagination. When we refuse to see the need in your world, open our eyes. When we listen to only those who agree with us, open our ears. When we find comfort in ignorance, fill us with insa the insatiable desire to learn your truth. When we grow comfortable with the way things are, agitate us until things are the way you want them to be. When we think that violence is inevitable and peace unrealistic, Surprise us. Prince of Peace, forgive us. Let us run to you, calling to you, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Okay. I don't have this hymn circled, but we're going to do it anyway. The hymn, please stand for the hymn of preparations on page 591. today comes from Luke, but uh, if, if we're looking for scripture that deals with uh, pride and humility, uh, it, is, it is a theme that's found all throughout scripture. Uh, but the scripture today comes from uh, Luke 18, 9 to 14, and it of course is the uh, publican and, and the Pharisee. Get rid of this, some of this stuff here. And uh, a quick story. Uh, years ago, uh, one of my heroes in the choir, I, I grew up in the choir, I started in the choir when I was 15 years old, and uh, was Mac McFeely, and he used to sing a song called The Publican, and it was about this particular scripture, and he just sang it so so wonderfully. I know Rusty's nodding and those old timers and uh, I was going to say Judy as, as an old timer, and, but I won't, I won't say that, Judy, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, all of us old timers remember him singing that song, and he just had this soaring tenor voice, and he just sang it so magnificently. Uh, but anyway, that's where this scripture comes from, and sort of the inspiration for, for all, all of this. Uh, listen, people of God, for the word of the Lord. Uh, then Jesus told this story to some who had great self-confidence and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a dishonest tax collector. The proud Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else, especially like that tax collector over there. For I never cheat. I don't sin. I don't commit adultery. I fast twice in the week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance, and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you this, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For the proud will be humbled, but the humble will be honored. For the proud will be humbled, but the humble will be honored will be honored. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, would, you pray, would you pray with me, please? Loving and gracious God, take the message that you've placed on my heart today and remove my pride, hubris, prejudice, bias, 
transform my human words and thoughts into the message you wish to place on your people gathered here. Send your spirit to touch our hearts and clear our minds to receive your truth. For it is in our Savior's name we seek the truth. Amen. Oh, those Pharisees. They never get it right. I'm afraid I'm a Pharisee. Uh, but uh, they never seem to be a good example. Uh, they make spectacularly bad choices. They just don't get it. But then, of course, we don't really get it either, do we? What are you proud of? What is it today that you can look at and say, this is what I did. Look at what I have. Look at what I've accomplished through my efforts. This fall, I have been blessed with what I'm calling anonymous celebrity. And I, I, I toyed with, with titling the sermon anonymous celebrity as well. Uh, but I, I, you're going to see where I'm going with this. On September 13th, I was asked to give a lecture at the Heinz History Center uh, in the Ambassador Series program. Now, this is a tremendous honor. It's a big deal for historians, but for the average person out there sitting in the pew, yeah, not, not, not so much, not, not such a big deal. Uh, on the Monday before the lecture, Sandra Baker, who runs the program for Heinz, calls me and says that it's possible that C-SPAN may be coming to tape this presentation. Wow, C-SPAN. My immediate reaction was, indeed, wow, what a great opportunity for the Historical Society. Then, of course, my ego kicked in. Uh, I'm going to be on national television. Millions of people are going to see me give a lecture. Then the insecurity kicked in. I'm going to be on national television. Millions of people are going to see me give a lecture. Uh, that's kind of intimidating. What if I mess up? What if I make a mistake? Uh, what if I, people, people are going to realize that I'm actually an idiot? Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Um, then I became a pessimist. Oh, C-SPAN's not coming for you. Why would C-SPAN possibly come for you? Oh, well, I thought C-SPAN probably won't even show up. So Wednesday, sure enough, Sandra emails me, C-SPAN is coming. Uh, not only that, she adds that C-SPAN has never taped a lecture at Heinz before. I was to be the first. Intimidating. Externally and spiritually, God kept me in check, my pride in check, but was, what was going on inside of my head was a complete other matter. I, I, was, uh, I was going to be hobnobbing with David McCullough, and uh, he was going to be giving me a call and asking me, you know, all, all of the things. And most of you probably don't even know who David McCullough is, but Rusty knows, he, he's laughing. Uh, I, I, was, I was going for the, for, for the moon. My, my, my pride was getting a bit out of control. Uh, uh, I wanted everyone to know that I was going to give a lecture on national television. God helped me keep it together, though, about, to the world, but inside I was, uh, I, at least outside I appeared humble. So the week before the broadcast, God decides to challenge me even more. I got a call from Dave Zakowski from the Post-Gazette. He wanted to interview me for two stories. First, the Cement City walking tour that's this afternoon. And then they wanted to actually profile me. And I thought to myself, they want to profile me? They've, it's official. They have finally run out of, the Post Gazette has finally run out of people, to, and they're going to try to find somebody to actually, uh, they, they, they're, just, they're just desperate for, for anyone. Uh, I must admit that it was fun to talk about myself. I never realized what a, what, what a truly interesting and fascinating person I am. Uh, I was beginning to become a victim, though. And I, and I slowly realized that, uh, of the dictatorship of pride that C.S. Lewis, and that's the title of the sermon, it comes from C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, uh, and it is indeed the dictatorship of pride. Lewis talks about in his book. Uh, fortunately, God sent me two life preservers of perspective. First, no one at church or choir practice said anything about the articles in the PG, or, and I know that no one saw the C-SPAN because it was last Sunday at 2 o'clock, and what were you all doing last Sunday at 2 o'clock? <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Everyone was watching the Steelers, except, of course, my uncle and aunt. My, 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 my mother missed it. Um, the point here is not the accomplishment or the recognition. The point is to show how easily we are seduced into 
the dictatorship of pride. And this partly comes from, uh, a th this, this whole idea comes from something that Rusty said a few weeks ago. If you, if you, if you recall, Rusty came up and talked about how he was going to, 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 to go to Ethiopia and he was going to become, and I, I'm sorry if this is some, some, some kind of a slur, but the, the great white father, the, 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 the idea that he was going to, to bring light to, to, to the dark continent kind of a thing. And of course, he was stopped short by the by, by 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 God as 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 I am. Um, the point is how easily we're seduced into that, and how easily we turn our focus inward, and how truly absorbed, self-absorbed we actually are. How often do you say to people, "I, me, or mine"? Uh, you know the Beatles song, "I, me, I, I, me, mine" by George Harrison. All through the day, I be mine, I be mine, I be mine. Uh, and, and of course, that comes, Harrison takes that from the Hindu philosophy of the duality of ego. Uh, it's uh, the song principle, the mirror, the, the song principle and the, is a mirror of the Christian principle of and teaching of balancing our ego and self esteem, our pride and our humility. What C.S. Lewis called our dueling natures. Too much of either leads us to turn inward and fail to reflect the glory of God. Pride causes us to ignore or not recognize the blessings that God indeed has showered on us. This past year, our Sunday school class read Mere Christianity. Today, I want to look at one chapter of that book, uh, what's, what Lewis called The Great Sin, The Dictatorship of Pride. Uh, let me read an excerpt from, from that for you to give you a bit of a flavor of where, where, where Mr. Lewis is coming from. Uh, unchastity. Anger, greed, drunkenness, and all that are mere flea bites in comparison to pride. It was through pride that the devil became the devil. Pride leads to every other vice. It is the complete anti-God state of mind. The other and less bad vices come from the devil working through our animal nature. But pride does not come through our animal nature at all. It comes direct from hell. It is purely spiritual. Consequently, it is far more subtle and deadly. The devil laughs. He is perfectly content to see you become chaste and brave and self-controlled, provided all the time he is setting you up in the dictatorship of pride. Do we have any Lewis fans in, 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 in the congregation today? I can see no one from the Sunday school classes raising their hand. Okay, Harry, Harry's, yeah, Harry, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, he's, gonna, he's got a copy in his breast pocket. Um, I know there, and I know there weren't men in our Sunday school class besides me. Uh, so, a quick background on Lewis. Clive Staples Lewis was born in Belfast in 1898, and grew up in a devout Protestant home, but chose to declare himself an atheist at 15. He later recalled his atheism: "Atheism was neither quote passionate nor convincing." End quote. At the age of four, he demanded to be called Jack, a nickname he adopted after his dog Jacksy was killed by a car. Jack Lewis fought in the horrific trenches of World War I, was wounded, returned home, attended Oxford, and became a fellow in the English Literature Department at Oxford's Magdalen College when he was, get this, 26 years old. Absolutely incredible. In 1931, he became a Christian with the help of another Oxford fellow, J.R.R. Tolkien, and together they formed a literary club called the Inklings and met weekly at the Eagle and Child Pub to entertain each other with anthropomorphic tales of fantasy revolving around a decidedly and intentional Christian theme. Eventually, many of those stories appeared in best-selling books and popular films. Tolkien's, of course, is... Somebody say it. Lord of the Rings. Thank you. And, of course, uh, Lewis is... Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is part of that whole, the, 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 the whole thing. Uh, Lewis became one of the great um, Christian apologist writers and speakers of the 20th century. Our message today is taken from arguably his greatest work, which of course is Mere Christianity. And Mere Christianity did not start out as a book, but rather a series of radio talks broadcast over the BBC between 1941 and 1943. It's incredible to me that an intellectual 
like Lewis, was chosen by the BBC, but they were different times. Think about how things have changed in the attitude of major media broadcast networks. Today, we're, we're suspicious, even contemptuous, of intellectuals as they are derisively defined by political pundits. Remember the 2004 elect presidential election. What was one of the things they said about Al Gore? He was out of touch with reality because he was too smart. He was an elitist. We don't want somebody, we don't want somebody smart being the president. His intelligence was in spun as a liability. Now we need to be careful how intel now we need to be careful how intelligent we seem. Kathleen Norris opens the foreword of the 2003 edition of the book with this advice. She writes, this is a book that begs to be seen in its historical context as a bold act of storytelling and healing in a world gone mad. And of course, the world that Lewis was living in was the world of World War II, the Blitz. He was living through that daily. It, the Blitz, of course, was intended to soften England up for Operation Sea Lion, which was Germany's inevitable invasion of the British Isles. The inspiration and catalyst for the madness is what Lewis describes as the great sin pride. We need to go back to the pride of the cruel terms of the Treaty of Versailles and the pride of the resulting bitter revenge that drove Hitler and Nazi Germany. Pride is the evil at the root of all war. All wars, no matter what the cause, no matter how justified they are, uh, we torture and rationalize the biblical principle of the just war to fit our needs, not God's. The most dangerous form of pride is, of course, spiritual pride. Through spiritual pride, we consider ourselves more virtuous, more insightful than other believers. If you ever hear anyone talk about God, and it doesn't include mercy, justice, grace, or compassion, then it cannot be what God thinks. Those are the things that the devil can't tempt us with or turn to use for his purposes. It's impossible for God to allow us human believers to marginalize or exclude other believers or non-believers. Pride sets us, sets us at odds with our neighbor here and around the world. Our pride causes people to resent us, to covet what we possess, leading to jealousy, anger, and violence. Lewis, in mere Christianity, is dealing, of course, with the extreme pride of Adolf Hitler in particular and Nazi Germany in general. While there's a dysfunctional mental, dysfunctional mental pathology with Hitler, we are partly able to explain the behavior of the German people. Uh, the armistice is not a surrender. It's simply an agreement to end hostilities in order to negotiate a peace treaty. The resulting Treaty of Versailles was a severe document negotiated out of pride by the Allies and intended to punish. The reparation payments destroyed not only the German economy, but created a desperate competition for simple survival in that country. Desperation will make us all compromise our values. We can say they won't, but they will. Lewis well knows that the devil is not without skills. The devil is smart. He deceives us all the time and he's good at it. Has anyone ever read the screw tape letters? Screw tape letters, screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis, screw tape letters, great, an an another great C.S. Lewis book. In the screw tape letters, uh, Lewis explores the relationship between Uncle Screw Tape and Undersecretary Demon, mentoring an apprentice demon who is, happens to be his own nephew, a, a man by the name of Wormwood. You're recognizing it now, Rusty? Okay. At first, uh, as his first assignment, Wormwood is given the charge of a young man known only as the patient. In his eagerness to impress Uncle Screwtape, Wormwood devises elaborate plans to lead the patient into committing a single spectacular sin, similar to Hitler, Stalin, Mao, uh, the Native American genocide here. I mean, everyone, every country is guilty of some spectacular sin. But Uncle Screwtapes tells Wormwood the simplest sins are the most effective. This is what he says, quote from Uncle Wormwood. The safest road to hell is the gradual one, explains the mentor. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without mileposts, without signposts. Keep the patient passive and irresponsible. It is God who wants men and women to be concerned with others. Our job, dear nephew, is the business to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. 
keep them thinking what will happen to them to turn inward. The definition of pride, straight from Webster's, I didn't use Wikipedia, Diana. We had a Wikipedia discussion this morning in uh, uh, Sunday school. Definition of pride, a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one, uh, one's own achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities and or possessions that are widely admired. We can have family pride. We can have stealer pride. Well, maybe not this year. Uh, ethnic pride, national pride, pride in your compassion, pride in your generosity, pride in your humility. Pride in your pride. I take pride in my baseball card collection. Uh, my television celebrity, uh, if you will. It's amazing how many opportunities we have to be proud. Where does your pride lie? Are you proud of your faith? Whoa. There is indeed a question that could take us to a variety of places. Just remember the publican and the Pharisee. Pride is an emotion, again, that is directed inward, intended to make one feel superior by making others feel inferior. I think what we mean when we want to say whether we're proud of something is that we're, or we're pleased, that we're pleased or we're grateful, uh, we're thankful for a blessing from God. That's the genius of the devil. He makes us believe we're actually serving God, when in reality, we become the Pharisee, praising ourselves in our own prayers. Pride, as Lewis says, is purely a purely spiritual sin. Every sin has a spiritual component, but pride is different. Pride becomes a friend, a source of support and affirmation. Pride can deceive us. Pride lies to us. Pride tempts us. Pride makes us commit some very unchristian acts. No matter how we rationalize it, pride is evil. There is no such thing as good pride. And I had an argument one time with Mr. Dobby, and I, 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 I love Mr. Dobby, just a, just a tremendous, tremendous man about pride. And uh, I, I, I don't know why that just popped into my head, because I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's strange what God puts in my head, because I'm editing this sermon as I'm going along. So to shorten it up, I, I originally was going to say this is... This is halftime. This is my problem. I, I, I get diverted. My attention gets diverted. But um, I, I apologize for that. You're used to a real professional. We are raised to be creatures of pride in our culture, but not our Christian faith. So consequently, we live in this dual existence, uh, causing us to rationalize one institution against the other causing us then further to diminish both. Uh, we try to marry these two distinct and unique parts of our lives into to a compatible relationship that scripture tells us is destined to fail. And yet we never learn, we still continue to try. We don't admit our own pride, but we take pride, or we take pleasure, excuse me, in pointing out the pride of others. The worst thing we can do uh, is deceive ourselves into believing that we are not proud. Uh, false humility is as bad as obvious pride in the eyes of God. Lewis contends that everyone is proud. The first step is to simply admit that we are proud. Personally, I'm proud of my humility. I'm great at being humble. Pride masquerades in our culture as a de desirable virtue virtue, we fool ourselves into believing pride, a sin, can be turned into a positive. We, la we rationalize the guilt in our culture and our nation. Uh, when we sing God Bless America at the ball game, what, what America are we asking God to bless? And what exactly are we asking for? God's blessings are given on his terms. Do we want God to bless the America we want, or do we want God to bless the America that God wants? There's a question. Do we want to be proud of our blessings, or accept and acknowledge them humbly and grateful, gratefully? When has pride ever led to humility? Wade Davis, and I typed, spoke briefly about Wade Davis this morning as a Canadian anthropologist who warns us, um, quote from, Mr. Da from, from Dr. Davis, these other cultures are not failed attempts, attempts to be us. They are unique manifestations of the spirit, the spirit of God. Other options, 
other visions of life itself. God loves and blesses all his people, not a chosen few. We are deceived into believing that God can only be worshipped in a particular way. Remember what Hamlet says to Horatio. There are more things in heaven and, he uh, heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. There are more things in heaven and earth, First Presbyterian Church of Monongahela, than are dreamt of in our philosophy. Uh, we are Horatio, who couldn't see beyond the geopolitical boundaries of Denmark and the royal court. Our hubris knows no bounds. We think everyone wants to be us. We feel as though we have no obligation to respect or learn from the ways that other cultures worship God. We're doing them a favor by making them like us. You know, God wants us to work hard as individuals. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not making an attack on our system or America. I know people are going to construe that. And I, I realize that. But this isn't an ideal. This is a rule that God has. God blesses us with work to extend those benefits that bless others. It's a virtue we call charity. Not charity as our culture defines charity, but it's charity that stems from the love of God. Christ and the Spirit in us. C.S. Lewis says that we water down that version of God's rule to what Lewis calls soft soap Christianity. We don't take Jesus seriously when he says if we have two coats, we should give one away to someone in need. When God says we owe him everything, we bargain it down to 10% and we're pleased when we achieve that number. We don't like the verses of scripture that encourage us to take care of the poor, to treat them as brothers and sisters. I hear Christians complain all the time about the welfare state and health care. Taxes that go to the undeserving poor. You know who they are. They violate not only the cultural ideals, but also they're guilty of the seven deadly sins. They're slothful, they're greedy, they're gluttonous. Wrath, lust, envy, pride. The most important of the deadly sins. Why do we only see the worst in the poor? I think it's because of our own guilt in the seven deadly sins. We're sort of like Sisyphus. You know, remember Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill? He's got to get it up that hill to the top of the hill. But what does happen is that when he gets it to the top of the hill, it rolls right back down. It doesn't, isn't that what God does to us? He rolls that boulder right back down that we're trying to put up there, and we ignore the boulder that he wants us to put up there. We want to push our own boulder up there. We should fear pride like Martin Luther. We should treat it cautiously. Martin Luther wrote, I am more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope, self. Instead of pride, we need to be grateful and humbled by the grace we have received from God. Pride lets us feel as though we are more deserving of God's gifts than others. God's grace cannot be earned through hard work. We know that. Pride is the great rebellion. While other sins may inadvertently create competition between people, pride at its heart and essence is competition. Winners and losers, rewards and punishment. Haves, have-nots. Pride seems to only unite people in causes against someone, group, or idea. Pride creates enmity, not just between people, but between us and God. We rationalize our behavior through pride. Pride leads to disaster. There are some misconceptions about pride, though. Pleasure at being praised is not pride. Building, ground, building and grounds, we're very proud, we're very pleased, we're very grateful, we're very humbled uh, by when we complete a job and people recognize our work. Pleasing someone and getting attention are two different things. Uh, take, thinking one is superior to another is, a, is really the problem. Genuine admiration that is earned is not pride. Pride insinuates itself into our lives without even noticing. Turned inward, pride is sinful and destructive. Turned outward, pride reflects God's glory and the gifts he has given us, not the gifts we think we've somehow earned on our own. The tension between positive pride in the gifts that God gives us and the sinful pride of, of self is a delicate balance. We tend to flop between the extremes. Either we have no, little or no self-esteem, I see this in school all the time, little or no self-esteem, 
kids in school, or they are think that they are better than everyone else in school. Both of these are dangerous because they both undermine who Christ is in our lives. When we struggle with self-esteem, we undermine the work Christ has done in our lives. We are worthy because Jesus says we are worthy of his love. Jesus has placed value on us, each and every one of us, and declares us righteous. We don't need to run from pride to the point we feel unworthy of love. The feeling that we aren't good enough allows Satan just to dig into us all that much deeper, destructively, as sinful pride. In the same way, prideful sin undermines the work Christ has done in our lives because it exaggerates our goodness, our work, our better than that person's status. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross declared us all righteous before God based on what Christ did, not what we have done. You cannot be more or less righteous than someone else. We have been declared righteous, period. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. Two people went into the First Presbyterian Church to pray. Which prayer will you offer to God? And to God be the glory. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, we pray that your message has gotten through to the people who come here to find you, to find the truth, to find Christ. Lord, we, we want to continue to be humble and, and, a, and a servant to you. Show us where we are making our mistakes with pride, and lead us into your truth, into your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Would you stand with me, and we will read our affirmation of faith. We believe that our Lord Jesus Christ offered himself a voluntary sacrifice to his Father for us, that he suffered for sinners, that he was wounded and plagued for our transgressions, that being the clean and innocent Lamb of God, he was in the presence of an earthly judge, that we would innocent before the tribunal seat of our God. We believe that he remained the only and well-beloved and blessed son of his father, even in the midst of his anguish and torment, which he suffered in body and soul for the satisfaction of the sins of the humanity. We profess that there is no other sacrifice for sin. We believe that it was impossible for death to hold in bondage the author of life, that our Lord Jesus Christ crucified, dead and buried, who descended into hell, did rise again for our justification and brought life again to us. We'll close with hymn number 648.
charge is simple. The mission God calls us to is one of service and compassion and humility. Set your pride aside and humbly join Christ in that mission as witnesses to God's eternal reign. Go in love, peace, serve the Lord. And as you do that, and if you do that, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now, this day, and every day. Amen.